All right, good morning. We good? Good morning, Tara. My name is Paul. I serve as one of the pastors here. Uh, as Pastor Ed mentioned at the beginning of the service, it's been an interesting week uh, here at Terra Nova. I've actually had uh, the number of times, Dennis, I'm going to have to just take this off. I've actually had the opportunity to spend uh, several days out in the woods and have caught a number of just beautiful sunrises, which uh, have reminded me of a verse from Isaiah 9 that I've, when I've seen these sunrises, I've, I've thought of each time. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light dawned. Uh, it was just a helpful reminder for me that even in the midst of of dark places and dark times that God still dawns and sheds light on our lives. And, and what, what even a timely reminder that is in, in Advent, of what that is, that, that these things, that Advent is the coming of light, so moving from darkness to light, from despair to hope, from lament to joy. All of these things we're reminded of uh, in the season of Advent. Every year, if you've been at Terra, uh, you might know this, we try to find a local organization uh, that we have good relationship with to partner with us during Advent uh, so we can raise money, we can come alongside of uh, an organization this year. Uh, Love 146 is going to be our org organization that we're partnering with. So uh, often when Pastor Ed has introduced a guest speaker to you, he said it's a pleasure to introduce friends. And I, I totally get what that feels like. It's a pleasure uh, just to be able to introduce to you, to you today not only Love 146, but in a minute Rob Morris, uh, who's a friend, but also this is an organization uh, that, that partners with us in demonstrating and proclaiming the gospel uh, when they can. So uh, you're going to hear more about uh, Love 146 in a minute through a video, uh, but Love 146 exists to end child trafficking, nothing less. Uh, it's an organization that uh, Matthew Miller, who is part of our Saratoga congregation, he was in uh, here in Troy before we spun off Saratoga. Uh, he is on staff at Love 146 now. Uh, it's an organization that I had the pleasure of serving on their board for four years, I think. Uh, and that was just a great joy uh, to do that and to serve alongside with that organization. This is, uh, I'm not sure there's going to be a better voice today for our church to kind of help us journey what it is to move uh, from lament to hope. Because this is an organization that fights this battle uh, day in and day out in the work that they do uh, in the lives of children around the world. So you're going to hear a lot more about Love 146 in the month ahead uh, as we talk to you about different ways that you can help support and partner with them. Uh, Rob Morris is going to be teaching us today, uh, kicking off Advent with this theme of how we move from uh, lament to hope. In the lobby today uh, is Heather Fisher, who leads the local task force uh, for Love 146. I'd encourage you all after the service to connect with her. Uh, and Matthew will be out there as well, so you can learn more about Love 146, how you can partner with them. Uh, but just to give you a better feel for the organization, what it is they do, uh, we have a short video that we're going to play. Uh, and after that video, our good friend, who's a friend not only to me, but I know to so many of you, he has spoken here a couple times now, uh, is Rob Morris will come and share the word with us as well. So uh, watch this video, then Rob will join us after that. This isn't about me, you, them, or even her. All of this is about all of us. This isn't a story. It was a real night in my real life, the fall of 2002. Some friends and I joined an undercover investigation. They tried their best to prepare us, but nothing could prepare us. Girls in matching red dresses, men ordering by number, off menus. I had to resist every impulse in my body to unhinge and eliminate this nightmare. But it was her who taught us different. Number 146. They hadn't price tagged her soul yet. She represents the multitude. A teen sold online by a man who says he loves her. A boy who becomes Monsieur only to find his boss and clients demand more. A little girl broken into pornography at the age of six years old. 
a team coaxed to a foreign land with the promise of education, instead forced to work off an insurmountable debt for the journey. A girl from a village promised a job in the city to help her family, only to find herself here, her name now a number, sold on a menu. The look in her eyes was defiance, humanity, power. She left us no room to be the heroes. It was her fight we'd be joining. We could have been Rage 146, Vengeance 146, or Despair 146, but she inspired us to respond differently, to respond with love. Love, brave enough to stare down the darkness, not look away. Love that listens, actually listens. Love that rolls up sleeves and steps into gaps, providing space to recover. Gifted workers and holistic care that goes beyond a blanket and a bed. A long haul kind of love, lasting through the grief to the carving out of a new life, to the everything in between. Love that treads upstream to prevent, reaching children before traffickers do. Love that equips them, their families, their communities, to see the tactics and signs of exploitation. We are a love that does not sit back, but that leans forward and digs down and in deep, joining the grassroots abolitionists, pioneering the dark corners most of us will never see, most will never know to see. We don't know what happened to her, but we carry her number with honor, sorrow, and a growing hope that her story can be different for so many others. This is not a charitable cause to be supported. This is an emergency. Good to be back with you here at Terra Nova. Um, we deeply appreciate uh, your level of engagement uh, with the work of Love 146. You guys have been in this with us for, uh, for quite some time. And um, yeah, on behalf of all of us, I just want to say thank you. We're unbelievably grateful for your passionate support. I'm thrilled that Paul is going to be coming with me in a couple weeks to see the work firsthand, uh, specifically in the Philippines. And so that's going to be, if we were just talking, I think we're going to be spending more time on an airplane than we are on the ground, but it's going to be a really powerful, um, powerful time. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that um, this is the first Sunday in Advent, and we're, and we're talking about hope, because if you haven't noticed, um, we're living in some really dark times, and it seems like it's getting darker and darker, right? When you talk about um, racism and terrorism and, and the refugee crisis and politics, and all of it just seems to be getting darker um, and darker. And so 
I don't know about you, but that sort of amplifies Advent for me, this sense of expectation, this sense of hope, and even the, 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 the discipline of lighting a candle um, to light um, darkness is such a powerful, powerful uh, thing. And, and oftentimes people, um, when, when they hear about what we do, you know, I, I, I tell people all the time that I'm kind of like the dinner guest from hell. When I go out to dinner with people and people say, so what is it that you do? I'm kind of like, you don't want to know what I do because it's going to spoil dinner. Um, uh, because the issue that we deal with, the trafficking and exploitation of the most vulnerable of, of our children, is a really, really dark issue. And it's very easy to give in to despair when you start hearing the statistics and the numbers and all of that. And, and I've been exploring um, this thing in the last year, this understanding of hope um, being um, a defiance. Uh, this sense of defiance. And uh, you just saw a video on uh, the founding of our organization was actually birthed out of meeting a child who was in this situation but had not been broken yet by the situation. And there was this fight, this defiance, literally, um, in her eyes. And there's something about hope in the midst of despair that carries this sense of defiance and almost practicing hope as an act of defiance defiance in the midst of what looks like despair and darkness is a really powerful thing. And I think it's what even this first Sunday in Advent represents, this act of um, hope being defiant. In fact, I just received a video um, from our, uh, uh, our work in the Philippines of our children um, singing Christmas carols, songs of hope. And I was undone. My wife and I watched it yesterday, and we were just leveled watching kids who you would think shouldn't even have a reason to smile again, singing with such joy and understanding what redemption actually looks like and what hope looks like even in the midst of despair and what light looks like when it shows up in darkness is such a powerful thing. Um, so I wanted to read out of Isaiah chapter 45, verse 3. So over the last 20 years or so, I've been trying to figure out how to learn to walk in the dark or see in the dark because so much of what we see around us, so much what we experience is enveloped in darkness. And I found this interesting passage in Isaiah 54, verse 3, that says this, I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. Now, I don't know about you, but the idea of treasures being found in darkness sort of like caused something to happen. Like what? What kind of treasures? Because darkness really gets a bad rap all the time. That we're afraid. How many of you were afraid of the dark when you were young? Any? Few of us, right? Or you know, and, and there's ever since we're we're little, there's this sense of man being afraid of darkness. Darkness is bad. Darkness represents something that we don't want. You know, every movie you've seen, like I think about Lord of the Rings with the approaching shadows and the darkness that's coming, and there's this sense of like foreboding. And even when you're little, there's the classic thing of like, hey, I'm afraid of the dark, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the covers up over my head and light a flashlight, so I'm sort of safe in here, which is not a reality anyway, right? It doesn't really necessarily mean it's not dark out there. It's just that now I've created this false sense of security under my blanket with my flashlight, and so the darkness isn't there anymore. But it is still there. And I find this passage in Isaiah that talks about finding treasures in darkness, and I'm thinking, what is that? What kind of treasures can actually be found in darkness? So instead of escaping from darkness, is there a way to actually look into the darkness and see something different than just the thing that causes us to despair or become afraid? And I remember the first time in my life that I can remember this sense of being thrown into darkness. It was a moment where there was no sense of light anymore in life. There was this sense of like, what is, you know, what is going on? And, and it was when 
My wife was, we have six kids. When my wife was pregnant with our third child, we were celebrating like crazy. We love kids. And I remember um, right after we had found out that she was pregnant, I had to go on a trip overseas. And when I was overseas, I remember sharing with my friends that I was with over there the good news that, you know, we're having another, an, another baby and we we're so excited. And one of the things that is, the, is, is good for me about leaving home is coming home. Like the minute I leave my front door, I can't wait to get back home again. And Matthew knows this. Matthew Miller, who travels with me often, knows that it's just like, I just want to get home. Um, and so when I get home, I'm normally greeted by a bunch of kids that are, you know, jumping on me and glad to see daddy's home. My wife is there. And, and there's this sense, this is home. This is where I belong. This is my family. And, and um, so I remember this trip. I couldn't wait to get home because I wanted to continue the celebration of us having our third um, child on the way. And I remember remember getting home that particular night from this trip, and I walked in, and my kids were nowhere to be found. It was such an odd scenario. It wasn't the typical homecoming that I was used to. And I remember walking in. My kids aren't anywhere. There's silence. I walk through the house, and I hear this sound coming from my living room. And I walk into the living room, and it was my wife sobbing, crying, face down on the couch. I run over to her. I'm like, what's going on? What's wrong? What's wrong? And I remember her looking up at me, just sobbing, saying, I lost our baby today. That was the first moment that I could remember. This was over 20 years ago, um, that I remember this plunge off of a cliff into darkness, into this just void of what is this territory of grief that I've never really touched before and not having any sense of answers from God and the struggle that that ensues. And then from that point on and going on up until today, there's this sense of being immersed, if you would, in darkness. And man, you know, I, I remember hearing this, um, this philosophy even used in church where you won't get more than you can handle. I don't know where that has fa been found, but there's nothing in my Bible that I've been able to find where it says that you won't get more than you can handle, right? We use this even as a scripture of some kind. It is not a scripture. When it talks about sin, there's no sin that there won't be an escape from. But when it talks about, how many of you can attest this morning that you've had more than you can handle? How many of you are in a place right now where you have more than you can handle? In fact, this is, this is not a, a good theology when you think about it, um, that you won't get more than you can handle. I could never use that theology. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be face-to-face -face with children in our care. I could never sit down with one of these children, child, uh, children and say, hey, don't worry because you're not going to get more than you can handle. It's ridiculous. We will get more than, you, more than we can handle. But what, it, what do we do when we're in that place of darkness, when there seems to be this overflow? And man, what do I do with the situation that I'm in right now? I want to uh, see, read something out of Psalm 30, verse, verse 5. Very familiar passage of Scripture, but it's mostly one part of this passage that's familiar to us, where it says this, Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. The message version says it this way. The nights of crying your eyes out give ways to, way to days of laughter. And in the voice version, it says the deepest pains may linger through the night, but joy greets the soul with the smile of morning. It's interesting when you usually hear this passage talked about, we like to quickly skip over the first part that weeping may stay for the night and just get to the, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Sort of like, yeah, this is going to happen, but man, this is the good part. And we want to get to the good part really fast. But it doesn't change the reality just as much as it is a reality that joy comes in the morning and that there will be days of laughter and that there, that joy will greet the soul with a smile of morning just as real weeping will endure for nights nights of crying your eyes out will happen and deepest pains may linger through the night, and that's just as much of a reality. So as I've gone deeper into this rabbit hole with the work that I do, we're faced with having to deal with this kind of darkness day in and day out, and what do we do in the midst of this kind of darkness? How do we survive this kind of darkness? How do we survive when things in the world seem to getting crazier and madder and madder? How do we survive in this place um, of darkness? You know, just... Uh, this past year, we brought, in fact, it was last December, we brought the youngest child that we've ever brought into our care, into our care in the Philippines, who had just turned two years of age. You guys, it doesn't get much darker than that reality. A two-year-old 
child. About two, almost a year and a half, maybe two years ago, we had two, two children. Right now we have uh, six children under the age of seven um, in our care. And about a year and a half, two years ago, we had two children. One was six years old, one was three years old, who came into our care and we were trying desperately to bring their, their perpetrator to justice. And through some horrendous and frustrating, heart-wrenching circumstances and roadblocks, we were prevented from doing so. And we were not able to bring this perpetrator um, to justice. And it was incredibly frustrating. And Matthew or anybody that worked with me during, the, during that time knows that I was not in a good place during that time trying to figure out what is this? Justice just seems like you're almost there and then it's not there. It's beyond your grasp. And when I think about even the children in our care, part of their healing and restoration and recovery takes place when justice actually happens. There's almost this open wound until justice happens uh, for them. And I was reminded during this time of a passage in Isaiah 59, which I think so clearly describes that sense of darkness when it comes to justice being just close enough to reach, and then it pulls away, where it says this in Isaiah 59, verse 9 through 11, so justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness, for brightness, but we end up walking in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. Could you feel the ache in that? That, man, there's this longing and this ache for justice. And if justice comes, it'll be like light coming into a dark place. But instead, we walk in deep shadows. This is the cry of so many people's hearts. This is the cry of the hearts of the children um, that we partner with. And so what are the treasures? When Isaiah talks about there are treasures to be found here, then what are these treasures when it just seems like everything is dark and in that place of darkness, it's frightening? There's a Japanese writer by the name of Hunichiro Tanazaki who wrote um, this essay called In Praise of Shadows. And he says this, and I think it's really beautiful. He says, we Orientals seek our satisfactions in whatever surroundings we happen to find ourselves, to content ourselves with things as they are. And so darkness causes us no discontent. We resign ourselves to it as inevitable. If light is scarce, then light is scarce. We will immerse ourselves in the darkness and there discover its own particular beauty. But the progressive Westerner is determined always to better his lot, from candle to oil lamp, from oil lamp to gaslight, from gaslight to electric light. His quest for a brighter light never ceases. He spares no pains to eradicate even the minutest shadow. An interesting sort of take um, from someone in a different culture looking at Westerners and our quest to dispel darkness by trying to basically get under the covers and light our flashlight. And so what kind of treasures are to be found in darkness? If darkness is an inevitable, and this is the way it is, and this is the reality, what do we do in the dark when we find ourselves in the dark instead of hiding under the covers? Here's a couple of things that I'm learning. And you guys, I'm not an expert in any of this. This is literally, we're in this right now, immersed in this. These are the sort of things that I'm starting to learn in this place of walking in darkness. One of the things that we do when we find ourselves in darkness is we wait. How many of you like to wait? Nobody, nobody likes to wait. But waiting is something that you do, right? Weeping may endure for a night, but there is a light coming. There is a dawn that is coming, and there is a waiting. And when I talk about waiting, I'm not talking about this passive, just sort of like, well, this is the way it's going to be. I might as well just wait here until some sort of streak of light comes. No, there is, there is um, an action involved in waiting. My, my wife and I, four of our six children are, have been adopted, and our adoption processes for many of our children have been very long processes and, and times that we thought it was never going to happen. We didn't just sit on our front porch in rocking chairs waiting for it to happen. We were working and working and working during that time. That waiting involves some sort of aggressive um, action, not just a passive, well, hopefully the light's going to come. There's an immersion that takes place. So we wait in the darkness. What else do we do? We hope in the darkness. I love Anne Lamott says this, hope begins in the dark. I'm going to read that again. Hope actually begins in the dark. You don't hope in the light, but you hope in the dark. The stubborn hope that if you just show up and try to do the right thing, the dawn will eventually come. You wait, you watch, and you work 
You never give up. There's this thing that we do in the dark that is hopeful. We wait, we hope. What else do we do in the dark? We love. We continue to love. We continue. This is our mark, you guys, as followers of Jesus. I love um, what Ed mentioned earlier about how you've come together even as a community during um, a, a, a time of such intense grief, and you show up and you serve. You know, I often think if we were so much quicker to pick up the towel and basin of being servants and lovers of people, if we were faster to do that than we are to pick up a protest sign, maybe the world would be a different place. Maybe there would be a bit more light in, uh, in, in the darkness. And so we continue to love. And I love even Jesus, who in John chapter 13, when he talks about this is your mark, this is how people are going to know you belong to me. And it's interesting that even the time that Jesus mentioned this to his disciples, this was an intense time. This was what we call the Last Supper. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation, you've been with somebody when they share their last words in a hospital room or whatever. The last thing that somebody says, you usually remember that forever. In fact, there are entire books written called Famous Last Words of famous people, the last things that they said. We remember those things. Here's Jesus, the last thing that he, the last time he's going to be with his followers, of all the things that he could think of to share with them, knowing that if I'm gonna say anything tonight, whatever I say tonight, they're going to remember forever because it's the last time that I'm going to be with them. Of all the theological concepts that he could have unrolled that night that he wanted them to remember forever, you know what he shares in those last moments with them? He says this, you guys, love each other. Love each other. This is how people are going to know you're my followers, by how much you love. So, man, what do we do in the dark? We hope, we love, we wait. And then the last thing is we listen. You ever notice that when one sense is taken, the other senses sort of kick into high gear and those senses are heightened? I think in the dark, we learn to listen a bit more than we actually talk. So what are the treasures when we're hoping and listening and loving and, and waiting? What are the treasures that we find in the darkness? I think we find the treasure of lament. And when I say that, I really mean a treasure of lament. Lament is one of these things that we sort of like, ooh, I don't want to get into that. It's why you rarely hear pastors and preachers speak out of the book of Lamentations. Lament is like, oh, that's darkness territory. We don't want to concentrate on that. In fact, we skip over the laments oftentimes even in the Psalms. When most of the Psalms are filled with lament, we just like to read the praise type Psalms and everything. Again, we like to get to the joy in the morning part quicker so we don't have to deal with the weeping may endure for the night stuff. But lament is such a powerful and beautiful thing when you think about it. I, I remember one of the first times that I was like impacted by the power and beauty of lament was when I was working with an organization called Mercy Ships and which provided medical care to the poorest of the poor in different places in Africa. And I remember one, one of the times that I was on the ship in Africa, there had been a mother who had brought her dying child as a last hope. She had walked for miles with her, with her child in her arms, hoping that somebody on the ship, one of the medical doctors on the ship, could save her child's life. When she finally got to the ship, she brought her child on. There was nothing that the, the physicians could do on, on the ship, and the child died while the child was on the ship. And it was horrendous. It, it just went right through the entire community, that sense of grief. And I remember um, there was a group of people um, in that community who, had, uh, who walked with this woman back to her village. And this scene of this woman carrying her dead child, who she had come to the ship with so much hope in her heart that maybe something could happen, maybe a miracle could happen, and it didn't happen. And as she got to her village, word already got to her village and her community before she got there. And as she entered into her village, people started pouring out of the huts of, uh, that, that were in the village and coming into the street. And they were wailing. They were making sounds that didn't even sound human. And they're wailing and they're throwing dirt. And the mother lays her child in the middle of the village in the dirt and she starts rolling in the dirt throwing dirt in the air dirt is flying people are wailing and screaming and everything and that is a picture of the right way to lament that is a proper reaction to the loss of a child in the West, we have civilized lament. We've civilized grief. We're afraid of going there. We're afraid. That's why in Africa and in places like these villages, you don't find therapists making a living. 
because people know how to lament. They know how to embrace grief in the proper way of addressing some sort of horrendous situation by reacting to it the way we should react to it. And this is the, this is the power of lament. Now we have these things where we, we come into these places and we're all quiet and, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so, we're trying to say the right words and stuff. Man, and it's okay to lament. There's one of the treasures I think found in darkness is this recovery, if you would, of lament. It's interesting. I, I saw a, a movie last year with, um, with Matthew, again, called Hector in the Search for Happiness. Anybody see the movie Hector in the Search for Happiness? Like one person, two people. Interesting movie. This psychologist finally gives up his practice, decides to go on a search of what happiness really means because every day he's faced with people who are unhappy, unhappy, and he's trying to figure out what happiness means, and he goes all over the world trying to find that out, and he hits this one place. He's up in Tibet um, or some mountainous region, and he's hanging out with this monk who just seems incredibly joyful, and he, and he says this to the monk. He says, man, I don't get it. You've been a fugitive. You've been in prison for your beliefs, you've lost your family, your loved ones, you've been through so much. How is it that you're so happy? And the monk with this smile and this knowing wise smile on his face, he looks at him, he says, because I've been through so much. It's because I've been through so much that I'm able to embrace um, uh, uh, joy in the midst of darkness, this recovery, if you would, um, of lament. It's interesting that we have an entire book of the Bible called Lamentations, but try to find a book in the Bible called Happiness. It's not there. It's not there. Lamentations, lament, is something that we recover in a place of darkness. What else do we recover, or, or what is a treasure to be found in darkness? Trust. Isaiah chapter 50 says this, Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. But now all you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches... Go walk in the light of your fires and the torches you've set ablaze. This is what you receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Really, if you were to paraphrase that in the Rob Morris version, go, you know, trust when you're walking in a place of dark and darkness, trust God. And if not, if you try to light your own fires or if you try to hide under the covers and light your flashlight, pretending that darkness doesn't exist or trying to escape darkness, you will end up lying down um, in torment. I, I heard this story of, this Catholic priest who had burnt out in ministry and was really needing to get some clarity for his life. He couldn't tell where he was going anymore, had no vision left, and he just desired some clarity. So he says, I'm going to take a year off from ministry. I'm going to go on a year-long sabbatical, and I'm going to start my sabbatical by going and visiting Mother Teresa in her home for the destitute and dying in Calcutta. And so he goes on this long trip to Calcutta, India. He ends up meeting with Mother Teresa when she was alive, and, and, and um, she, she meets with him, and she says, what would you have me do for you? And he says, man, could you just pray for me? And she says, how would you like me to pray? And he says, could you just pray um, that I get some clarity? I'm in a desperate place. I really need some clarity uh, for my life. And she says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he's like, what? He goes, I just traveled all the way to India to start my sabbatical to get you to pray for me, you know, for some clarity for my life. And she goes, no. She goes, I'm not going to do that because clarity is the last thing you're clinging to. She goes, how about instead I will pray that you learn to trust because trusting is what you do when you don't have any clarity. Trusting is what you do in the dark. Trust is one of those treasures that we found, find in a dark place. In fact, I want to read, there's an, another great passage here in Psalm 13, where you hear David lamenting. And you guys, it's okay to lament to God. Part of lamentations, if you look up the biblical understanding of lament, not only is it a lament of what's happening in the world, but there's also a lament to God to get him to do something about it. That it's okay, and God's not, a, not freaked out by our lament. And, and I love this, is so pictured beautifully here in Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. God, give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death, and my enemy will say I've overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Do you hear that lament happening there? But here's what's interesting. David, in this place of darkness, moves into trust realm, a treasure that he's found in darkness, because he says this in verse 5, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will continue to sing the Lord's praise, for he's been good to me. That's so powerful. Here's David lamenting this place of darkness. Man, I don't even know where you are right now. I look everywhere, and darkness is all around. How long do I have to wrestle with my thoughts? How long are you going to hide your face from me? Wow, lament, lament, but... 
in this place of darkness, I've learned to trust in your unfailing love because you have been good to me. Trust is one of those treasures found in darkness. Lament is another one of those treasures. What else do we find in that place of darkness? Here's a beauty. Company. You're not alone, man. You know, it's interesting. For the longest time, when, when I was in, years ago, when, when I was in, in, in church, I used to long for somebody to stand up during testimony time and not have a fairy tale ending. I long for somebody to just get up and say, man, right now things just stink. Things right now I just are just dark. I don't know what else to say. Thank you. Praise God. Go sit down. I'd be like, yes, somebody else. But here's the reality. If you look around this room right now, I guarantee you there's company in darkness. Darkness, we, we end up realizing that we're not alone. We find community even in the dark, not just in uh, the light. In fact, I would even go to say that if we're sitting with our blanket over our head with our flashlight on, more than likely you're alone in that place. Um, it's okay to come out from under the covers. What else do we find? What other treasures besides company, trust, and lament is beauty. You know, recently, my wife, we have a thing in, in uh, Hamden, Connecticut called Bulk Trash Month, where my wife goes out, where people can li like put anything out in, on the sidewalk, and my wife takes that as an opportunity to go take other people's stuff. And um, so uh, I remember uh, recently she, she brought back um, uh, this, this nasty-looking jar. It was a glass jar. It was just covered with all kinds of stuff and everything. I'm like, what are you going to do? But I thought, you know, I'm going to surprise her. She Stairs one night, um, she went to bed early, and I thought, I'm going to surprise her, I'm going to clean this messy jar up. And so I spent time, I got a scouring pad, I'm scrubbing the inside of this jar, getting all these flakes and things off of the jar, everything, until it was this shiny, beautiful glass. And that morning, the next morning, she came downstairs, and she was like, she found her jar in the sink strainer and stuff, she's just like, what did you do to my jar? I'm like, I cleaned it. Isn't it beautiful? She goes, no, that was gold flaking on the inside of that jar and everything. The thing that gave that jar value is what you thought was a mess and garbage or whatever. Now it's absolutely worthless. It's just a glass jar. But in my attempt to try to clean it up, I actually took away the value of it. And you guys, this is what ends up happening in the dark. It's what Isaiah talks about, the warning of don't try to light your own fires. Don't try to clean up the darkness. Find the treasures that are actually there because when we try to make an attempt, we usually end up screwing it up. You know, every year my family and I, we go to Maine for, for um, a, a week away and we go to like a, a cabin on a lake in the middle of nowhere. And I remember the first year that we did this, at night, it gets so dark. There's no light anywhere, right? And I remember the first time I'd have to, we'd bring our dog with us. And, 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 at, and at night, I'd have to walk my dog in the woods in the absolute dark. And I remember being so freaked out by every noise, any stick cracking. I'd be like, you know, there's bears up here. There's things that could kill me in the, in the woods. And, and so I'm walking with my dog just like, you know, and, and, and missed all the beauty of the darkness because I was so paranoid. And so I, I remember my wife laughing at me because I'd have a flashlight in my hand. I had one of those headlamps and stuff like that. It was like light everywhere. And then one year I was with my son and we sat out and we shut all the headlamps off and everything. And all of a sudden the sky became visible. The stars were just absolutely, you could almost feel like you could reach up and touch them. I'm thinking, I've completely missed this because in my attempt to light everything up, my attempt because of my fear of what might be in the dark, I'm actually missing out on the beauty. And we sat there for the longest time. We listened to the loons calling on the lake. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing sounds that I didn't hear before. And all that fear disappeared. Now, when we go up to Maine, I very purposely make sure this last year we went off the grid. No electricity, nothing. And it was awesome because there was beauty beauty to be found um, in darkness. In fact, I heard of a restaurant in Paris where you go into the restaurant and there's a really dim room that you, you sit in first and then eventually they bring you into another room where you actually dine in complete absolute darkness. There is no light, no candlelight. You can't see your, fa your hand in front of your face. This restaurant is booked months and months in advance. Everyone wants to eat in the darkness of this restaurant because people say that, man, it's the first time I ever really tasted food. It's the first time that I ever actually really listened to what my wife was saying because it was nothing to distract. It was complete darkness. Man, this glass of wine is per it could be a two buck chuck glass of wine from like Trader Joe's but it tastes exquisite because there's no other senses you see what happens in darkness there's a heightening of beauty that takes place it amplifies beauty I want to show you a, um, a, a, a slide here I don't know if you got this 
Check this. This is a great example of this. Um, there's nothing really amazing about this. This is the conductor of the Iraqi National Symphony Orchestra. It's an orchestra hall, a concert hall. There's nothing really beautiful or great. It's just like that's a typical scene. Check out this next picture. This started happening this past spring into the summer where this conductor of the Iraqi Symphony Orchestra, when there was a bombing in the city or some terrorist attack, he would show up there as fast as he could. He would set up his cello and he would begin to play this music. Soldiers would begin to gather around. Look at some of these pictures here. Soldiers would begin to gather around. Children would gather to him. People would begin to, they just began to weep as beauty would be showing up in this dark, horrendous situation. Situation. You guys, this is what happens in darkness, is beauty is amplified by the darkness, and a perfect example of that is seen right there. And then the last thing that I think is a treasure that we find in darkness is the love of God, is God shows up in the darkness. And, you know, I love, there's a great passage in um, uh, the Gospel of Mark where the women race to the tomb. Remember this? They, came, they come to the tomb after Jesus had been crucified. They get to the tomb. And you guys, imagine this scene first, that all his followers forsake him, right? The, the one that we think about all the time is Peter. Not only did he forsake him, but he denied him. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be Peter? To have been in that horrendous place. Talk about a dark, dark place. That man, not only did I forsake him, but I did the very thing that he said that I, would, that I would do and I said I wouldn't do. I denied I even knew him. He was my best friend. And I pretended I didn't know him. Talk about shame. Talk about being in a place of darkness. This would have been Peter's lot. I can't imagine what it must have been like when he was with the other followers, how he even rejoined the other followers. Maybe they were like, dude, we don't even want to be around you. Or maybe they were also in their own place of shame, thinking we're all in the same boat. But I would imagine even in the room, Peter was probably separated from the other ones just by his own shame, probably sitting in a corner like, I, I, you guys don't even want to be around me, man. This is what I did. You know, and, and that place of shame. And here the women go to the tomb, and you know the story, the angel comes to the tomb and says to the women, remember these instructions, go tell the disciples and Peter. Can you imagine God? This is a picture of the love of God, knowing the dark place that Peter would be in of his own shame, the, the God giving the instructions to the angel, listen, go tell the, the women that, he's, that, that Jesus is risen from the dead, but make sure you specifically mention Peter because he's going to he need to know that I still love him. He's going to need to hear his name. And so you know the story. The women come running back to the house. They say, the angel just told us that he's risen to tell you and specifically you, Peter. Can you imagine the hope and the light that came into Peter's heart and life at that moment when he heard his name. And it comes back to that passage again in Isaiah 45, 3. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who does what? Who calls you by your name. The love of God is found in the darkness. Beauty is found there. Company is found there. Trust is found there. Lament is found there. And every once in a while, we get to see that light break through in one of those ways or all of those ways together. We got to see this past spring, we got news, made international news of a perpetrator, a predator that was arrested in the Philippines for doing horrendous things. It was so bad that it made international news. Dozens of children who were abused by this perpetrator. He was arrested. And when his picture was on the front page of the news, the two girls that I mentioned to you before that justice was far from them recognized him as their perpetrator. He's now in prison and will probably be there for the rest of his life. And justice is accomplished. Light coming into a dark, dark place. So here's the basic bottom line reality, you guys, is that the world is getting darker. And I believe that God wants us to come out from under the covers. And when we hear him call our name, we're able to do so and bring beauty and hope and love in that place. I love Wendell Berry says this, to know the dark, go dark. Go without sight and find that the dark too blooms and sings. And then I want to reread what Paul shared in the beginning, which to me is the hope of everything and the hope that we celebrate this season. In Isaiah 9 2, the walked in darkness have seen a great light. For those who lived in a land of deep shadows, light, sunbursts of light, for a child has been born for us, the gift of a son for us. Let's pray.
So God, as we are inundated with stories of darkness day in and day out on our social media feeds, on our news media feeds, and over and over in our next door neighbors, in our own families, darkness seems to be growing. Father, would you give us eyes to see in the dark? Would you give us courage if we find ourselves hiding under a blanket trying to light a light? Would you give us courage to rip that blanket off, Lord, and immerse ourselves in the midst of the darkness? And thus may your gospel be proclaimed and demonstrated through our lives so beauty is amplified. Love and hope shows up in tangible ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.